it is my real pleasure to uh, give the floor uh, to those who have been educated being displaced, uh, being far from the, their homes, uh, and they're wonderful examples how, uh, how education can give birth to hope. They turned their hopes into realities, and the first one to introduce here is Yadira Vieira. You heard her before introducing herself. Yadira, this will be a testimony, so I will give the floor for you. Thank you everyone for being here, and I really can't thank uh, the network for um, having us convene here to talk about a topic that is so important and it's also very special to me. I am originally from Mexico. My parents immigrated to the United States 25 years ago, and uh, we, we've been living in the city of Chicago ever since. Um, I grew up in Pilsen, a predominantly Latino community, where um, Spanish was spoken. Uh, it was very, it's very vibrant in terms of uh, how cultural it is. Right now, it's like an art hub in the city of Chicago, and it brings me a lot of pride to know that I was raised in that community. Uh, growing up, I attended public schools, uh, but then when I started high school, my parents decided to try um, private education. So I started attending Cristo Rey Jesuit High School. Uh, and if you don't know about the Cristo Rey Network, I would encourage you to learn more about the network because it really changes lives. Um, and the way it does it is by allowing students to um, work and pay for at close to 70% of their tuition. And they don't just have any kind of job. Like every student has a job in corporate America, whether it's in a hospital, in a law firm, working for pretty much anyone um, in the downtown area, which is really amazing as a student. So if, during the four years that I was there, I worked, my first year I was working at an insurance company, and my last three years I was working for uh, a printing company in their legal department. The attorneys there, um, gave me real jobs. I helped them with their cases, and throughout those four years, I was able to grow into someone who not only uh, followed my parents' work ethic in terms of working really hard for something that, for us, was a privilege, being in the United States after my parents left family members, left access to a lot of their culture, now being in the U.S. meant that I really had to embody that sacrifice and make take take advantage of uh, everything that my parents risked. Uh, during uh, my senior year, two of the attorneys that I was working for, uh, they when they found out that I got into Georgetown University and that I decided I would attend the, the university, they hosted a small going away party for me, which meant so much because. If I hadn't attended Crystal Ray, I wouldn't have had access to working in uh, in a printing company at the age of 16 and contributing to my own education, but also having access to attorneys who guided me through the process of going to college and also felt so excited for me and genuinely excited that I would um, like, like them, have access to the education that Georgetown can provide. Once at Georgetown, well, before I say that, um, I think one of the reasons why I was able to even consider Georgetown as an option was clearly because a lot of the teachers at Christory believed in me, and they were fully committed in my success. And, but that also meant that they were committed to my parents' own success as they went through this experience with me. So they hosted um, sessions called um, Classes Para Padres, just classes for parents on just learning about like what it means to go to college, 
what it means to potentially have your uh, only daughter or your oldest daughter go away for college, um, what it meant to take out loans, uh, how to help your child or teenager open a bank account. Uh, and navigating through all of those conversations, my parents also accompanied me in starting this whole new endeavor because they only completed third grade. Uh, and they didn't have access to learning how to fill out the FAFSA or how to uh, ask for a better financial aid package. So my parents, when, we gra when I graduated, it was the whole family graduating because it was an endeavor that um, we walked through together and having access to Chris Ray's resources and the way, the manner in which they did it, which is very culturally sensitive. Uh, the school also embodies a dual language component and that allowed for my parents to walk into the school, ask a question in Spanish, and receive an answer in Spanish. Once I, I was at Dorshan, I found myself with a community that greeted me with so much joy and so much enthusiasm to have me not just there as a number, but as someone who embodied so much, um, so, so much hope. Uh, because I knew that I was really far away from my family, the first one in my family to go away for college, to go to college. And the, the four years, I recall always having not just mentors from my high school reach out to me, but also a lot of mentors at, at Georgetown check in, ask, how's it going? Can I help you go to Target? Can I help you go buy new pillows? And those questions, to me it meant so much because they were they were tuned into my needs, not just making sure that I graduated, but that I was comfortable in college. So I graduated from, uh, from Georgetown, I moved back to Chicago and I decided I wanted to go back to grad school, but that cost a lot of money. Uh, so I decided to work for a year, started grad school, and I remember my parents just not understanding what becoming a child child development specialist meant to them. They really wanted me to be a nurse or an attorney. It's something that they can um, say proudly, like my daughter embodies that American dream. But as, as they started learning more about why I wanted to do child development, especially when working with immigrant families and how, helping them understand that their child's social emotional development is very important in the classroom and for them to learn uh, it's important to address those needs uh, i think they they started to learn a little bit more about why having a jesuit education was important to me uh, i also continued to have the same mentors i had in high school they guided me through graduate school, and in fact, my um, the associate principal at the time, um, who was at Cristo Rey, he attended my graduate graduation with his family, and to me, that was a clear example of what true accompaniment means, and really help making sure that I not just started graduate school, but that I finished, and that I finished feeling proud, and also ready to really um, dive into the field in, in a way that, again, goes along with the mission of um, the Je a Jesuit education. Now I've been working with um, immigrant families in uh, at my parish, in a community in the south side of Chicago. Um, it's a community that has been infested with a lot of violence. Um, and now, in the recent years, uh, with this administration, a lot of fear in terms of the immigration policies and what they mean to these families. So we started Fortaleciendo Mi Familia, which is a, uh, we partnered with the University of Chicago uh, in USC, the University of Illinois at Chicago, in addressing their psychosocial needs through cognitive, low intensity cognitive behavioral uh, therapy. And so what we do is we have small, um, set, we have five to six families in a room 
uh, for a month, and we we talk about mental health and the stigma of mental health in the Latino families. We address the importance of communication and how to be in be more assertive while communicating. We also talk about depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, and address those topics in relation to what they're already experiencing within the community. Uh, we do this from a strength-based perspective, meaning that these families are never treated as if they are deficient. These families are resilient, they're very strong, and we create a space for them to know that, that they are, like, they have endured so much uh, coming from an immigrant background that now we need to learn what is working for them, but also what is not, and how we as not just the church, but also clinicians can help them uh, cope with situations like community violence or families getting detained and later deported. And for me, it's been a beautiful combination of what I do because I also work with the parents in relation to their children and how, and how we can talk about uh, these topics of family separation when it's actually happening. We had one, one family who said, you know, before uh, Trump became president, we used to joke about, like, if I, if I go over the speed limit, I may get pulled over and later deported. And it was a joke. And that now they can't joke about it because their children are actually afraid that it will happen because it's all over the news. We know it's happening. Similar to, to that, also how to address um, families feeling, uh, families who are, um, who have mixed status members within the family. And one thing that a lot of our families have expressed is that sense of guilt that now they are subjecting their children who are US citizens to this um, fear when it was their own choosing to immigrate to the US and now their children are afraid they're being bullied. And so these parents uh, express a lot of guilt and they, they wanna fix it but they don't know how to. So we walk through those emotions with them. To me, what's beautiful about this approach is that we bring in the whole family. So, so oftentimes, uh, a lot of the males in these families don't wanna open up about mental health. They don't want to talk about um, the anxiety or depression. And so we create the space that is safe and bring up the topics uh, and it's been a beautiful just journey with them because oftentimes after the four sessions, they want more. And we have a lot of the males in the room talking about uh, feelings and emotions that they haven't expressed before because within the Latino communities or families, uh, families often, oftentimes don't have the time or the space to address their mental health when they have two jobs or they have its basic survival in some of these parts of the world or cities. Uh, so creating this space for them has allowed them to not only understand that their mental health is very important, but also that their sense of belonging. These are families who have left so much in their homelands, who have risked a lot. And to come into a country that right now is uh, filled with um, hateful rhetoric that makes these families feel like I am um, hurting this country is really unfair. Uh, this last month I was in Rome, like I mentioned, and I, I addressed this topic of immigration and the mental health of our youth because a lot of them we know are experiencing suicidal ideation and, or some have been very successful at it, unfortunately. Uh, in the, we need to have those conversations with them. Uh, and during that time, I, my grandfather reunited with my mother after 25 years of not seeing her. And it, I, it was a beautiful moment that I unfortunately had to miss because I was in Rome. Uh, but I did talk about it during one of my conversations with the bishops because I expressed that some of these children who are fleeing their homelands or getting separated from their families at the border um, have to experience, have experienced months away from their parents. And it makes me very angry to know that any kid would experience, any child at any age 
would experience any percentage of the 25 years that my mom spent away from her parents. It, it's not, children should not be reaching milestones in detention centers. That, that level of trauma is gonna take years to heal. And it's, we, the system is working against them. And these are the families that need the most support because they're not, they don't belong to a system. And it's that, they are falling into an abyss of um, trauma, of pain that all, that continues to go unaddressed. And um, these are human lives. Uh, for me, it's been a topic that is very um, personal, and I I do it on behalf of my family because I know that everything that I have now, all the educational success that I've been able to achieve, it's been because my parents made the choice to sacrifice everything. And I really want to continue working towards make, making sure that families are treated humanely. Thank you so much, Yadira, for this powerful uh, testimony. Uh, by education, I had to embody the sacrifice of my parents when I graduated. It was the whole family graduating, and children shouldn't reach milestones in the detention center. I think this should be tweeted uh, from, from our conference, definitely. Thank you, Yadira. And uh, I would like to welcome here Nuras Musa Almata, uh, the student of uh, Manhattan College. Uh, he will also share uh, his story with us. And next one uh, joining us will be um, a guest from Kenya. Hello everyone, my name is Norris. Uh, I'm an international student from Syria and I study psychology at Manhattan College. But prior to coming to the US, I was a refugee in Istanbul. And this is like how this happened. So in 2014, I went to Istanbul, to Turkey, uh, fleeing uh, the war in Syria. And what I was told there is that I was promised a scholarship to go to France and study music, which I had a really great passion for. But what happened is that the people that were organizing the scholarship uh, were not trusted by the French government, and that caused the scholarship to break apart, and it simply did not work. And at that point, I found that I was I found out that I was stuck in Istanbul with no vision of the future, with no other solution. Because uh, since start, uh, starting 2011, getting Syrians uh, to get a visa to go anywhere in the world became almost impossible a very tough uh, thing to do, and if you ever got a visa, that's something that pretty much everyone would celebrate with you, not just for you, because it's one of the biggest events that could happen to us. Um, after staying in Istanbul for two years, I didn't know what to do, I didn't really have the vision of what I should be doing with my life, having no access to both education, work, and, uh, having, and health also as well was really hard, but what happened afterwards is that I was offered a job to work with a church organization doing psychosocial support with refugees. And when I work with, with certain people like myself who had nothing and were stuck in Istanbul and did not have much to go with, it was really cool because I saw a lot of kids with so much potential that they, didn't, that they did not go to college, they did not go to school. I saw people who were cheap computer geniuses, engineer geniuses, like just people who were given the chance would have changed so much. Uh, the fact that Syrians cannot go anywhere makes dreaming or hoping for a future career almost an illogical dream, something that you don't think about because you simply do not have the access for it. And that makes it really hard for a lot of people, which creates so much, uh, which creates too many uh, issues depression, anxiety, PTSD, hopelessness, being crippled. And the biggest problem was the language barrier because. So many, so many Syrians uh, were lucky to be able to learn Turkish really quickly, but a lot of people did, did not know how to speak English, so by the time they got to uh, Turkey, communicating with the Turkish community was very, very hard, and finding a job was even harder. And the fact that Syrians could not go to school or get a job, uh, the deprivation of education simply led to labor exploitation. A lot of people, because they did not get jobs or did not uh, that they were uh, 
they did not have education, they did not have the college certificates, they did not have their college degrees or any kind of certificates that prove they're educated in the field that they were trying to get a job at. Uh, made it really hard for a lot of people. And they ended up, you would see a doctor who worked in a tailoring factory being paid $100 a month, which is way below the uh, minimum wage in Turkey. And they will be exploited, exploited for months and months after that. And it's, it's very, very flippant. Um, in 2004, in 2016, at the beginning of 2016, I got an email from a couple named Teresa and Gabriel. They were trying to, they brought 62 Iraqi students during the Iraqi war to the US. And that was one of their biggest projects. And they decided to do the same projects with Syrian students. And I was one of the five uh, lucky ones that actually made it to America because right now all the, job, all the work that they're doing with other Syrian students are being sent to Canada because of the, the government and how it works here. Um, so I got an email at 11 p.m. at night that says, an opportunity to study in the U.S. Hello, Norris, would you like to go study in the U.S.? There's my happy college in New York City. That was like probably the craziest thing that ever happened to my life. <laughs> and uh, after that, I had to work really hard on getting the documents that would allow me to get the visa easily if I go to the consulate in Istanbul. But my first interview had five questions, and Harvard was one of them until she found me eligible, not eligible, sorry, not eligible to have a visa because she did not trust me enough based on four questions. The fact that I was 23 at the time and I was considerably a Muslim, not married, was a lot of red flags. They did not know if I was going to stay in the U.S., they did not know if I wanted to leave, they just had to know what I was going to do, so they just didn't trust me and said no. For my second interview, uh, I had to get a crazy amount of documents. I had to get a job contract in the organization I used to work with, and I'm going back after I'm done uh, studying psychology here to go back to the organization and continue doing work in psychology. Uh, I, had to get a, I had to get a paper, a letter from uh, a professor that teaches psychology and had to who specialized in PTSD and war trauma, which is why I'm, what I'm aiming for as a future career, and still did not offer too much help. I brought, I brought a house contract, like I had a, I brought a, a house lease back in Syria to prove that I have a property back in Syria that I would go back to eventually. That did not help as well. For my second interview, 35 minutes of hearing the words, I don't find this uh, eligible, I'm sorry sir, I don't think I can make it visa, this is not enough, you don't have enough documents, and for 35 minutes that was just, just like destructive, and it was a lot to go through for 35 minutes. At the end, I just looked at her and I said, so it's a no, and she's like, I'm really sorry, sir. And I was like, well, that was my only chance at education, or a future career in general. And what she did, she looked at me and she said, just give me five minutes. She went inside, I waited outside, I prayed to every god in existence, and she came out and she was like, all right, so I spoke to my supervisor who decided to issue a student visa. I almost like fainted. I was like, I was happy. Uh, what happened afterwards is that I had to work on preparing myself to come into the US and to be integrated in the community in Manhattan College, to be to live in New York City, which is a crazy city, and to adapt to everything that is happening around me as part of my new culture or part of my new identity as an international student that I was going to be studying in the US. A lot of obstacles I faced once I entered the which was the first uh, two hours interrogation at JFK, which literally included the question, are you single? Yes. Do you, uh, no. Sorry. Are you married? No. Do you have a girlfriend? No. Are you single? Yes. Why are you single? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they pretty much know everything about me at this point. They have all the details about my life since I was like probably five or as far, as far as I remember, they can have, they have everything. Um, after that, coming to Manhattan College is the first time I walked into Manhattan College realizing that I'm actually an educational institution, realizing that I'm going to school, that I'm going to be in classes with our students, that I'm going to write essays, that I'm going to have a degree by, by the end of the program four years after. That was, it's, it's still a hard feeling to describe because until today it's really hard to realize that you're one in thousands and thousands of Syrians that are studying in the US. A lot of colleges are afraid of taking Syrian people in because of the stigma. The stigma is a product of the, the uh, ignorance that people have about the rest of the world. Pretty much if you have everything you're comfortable in, with that the bubble is not going to be affected by anything that's happening in the rest of the world. And the fact that we have so many ignorant people who do not 
still thinking about what happened in the rest of the world is also a bigger problem. One of the questions that I'm really faced with is like, do you have buildings in Syria? Do you have a camel in Syria? And I will say yes for a camel part. <laughs> uh, coming here it was really, really hard, but my happy college really, really helped. The fact that the professor wrote the paper that assisted, uh, that assisted me in getting my visa was really, really helpful. Coming here, I was introduced to a wonderful community of people. The staff, the staff, and the faculty were so amazing. My professors, I love them to death. Uh, what they've given me, I wish can be given to others, because what I have now, I feel like it's not enough. And part of me feels guilty for being one of those one in a thousand Syrians that's being offered the chance to come to the US and study. It is, it's a tough, it's a really, really tough process. The fact that there's so much stigma about what being a Syrian is, or what being a Muslim is, what being an Arab is, or what being a refugee is, no one is trying to decode that within the communities and colleges. Like so many college students, until today I say I'm from Syria, and some people think it's a really nice country in the summer. And the fear that schools have is understandable. The fact that many Syrians do not have financial guarantee that they can join colleges, that they can go to school and provide for themselves. I understand that that struggle is really hard, and I do understand that colleges do not want to take the responsibility of helping Syrians. But if you're responsible for education, you're responsible for educating people, no matter where they come from, where they're from, what their situation is. Your job as an educator is to teach. You're not, your job is not to deprive people from coming to your college to study. And so far, Education, uh, my mom used to say something when I was a kid, she used to say, go to college and be a human being. And I was like, that was really funny because it was like, mom, I don't need a paper to say it. But the fact that I lived in Istanbul for two years, watching me and many other Syrian friends of mine, not having any access to education, have ruined us in many ways. Some of us went to drug addiction, some of us were exploited with labor, some of us had uh, trouble just finding who they are because they did not have access to anything. They did not know what they're about. They did not know what they're going to do. They have no clear vision of the future. The one thing that we always try to talk to Syrians in Istanbul is that we need to get out. We need to find a way to reach someplace safe. We need to find education. We need to get a career. We need to build ourselves all over again. Uh, part of the obstacles, uh, Ashish spoke about identity a lot, and identity is very important. And I believe that education is a huge part of this identity. Because prior to coming to the US, I always thought of myself, I was like, as a person, I'm incomplete. I need to be educated more about the topics that I need to, that, that will help me fulfill my future career. It will help me reach that point in time where I can say that this is who I am, this is what I've done, this is what I've studied, and this is where I'm about, this is what I can do. But the biggest fear that the government has about refugees coming to the US is that they're not going to leave. And that's understandable as well, but so many other refugees have a different issue, which is we're coming here to study and go back to help our people. We're not coming here to stay, we're coming here to build ourselves, we're coming here to gain knowledge, gain enough knowledge to go back and help rebuild Syria or, or assist any other or assist any other refugee in the world, whether they're Syrian or not. And that that in itself uh, that in itself becomes really hard because of the stigmas that are around today. A lot of, this, a lot of the solutions that could be done about this is that people could have events at their communities, like in colleges on campuses, that where they can speak about refugees, where they have people come in to speak about it, and that could help educate people around the room to let them know that there are so many things that what you thought might be wrong, what you thought could be right. And but leaving it blank just for thoughts is not going to be enough because that doesn't help anyone. Um, Manhattan College, first of all, has offered me a great scholarship, something that many other colleges don't. Being the only Syrian Manhattan College kind of provides uh, a problem of isolation, of being isolated in a community where I don't find anyone that is similar to me. That provides a problem as well. But the fact that college to get a Syrian is a really big deal. And today in the US, not so many colleges are taking Syrians in because of the fear of both the government and the financial part. Um, as I said, uh, the community I built, here, I built here has given me a great social support structure where uh, this 
despite the fact that I come from a war-torn country and I came to the U.S., the whole, like, uh, the whole part of, like, rebuilding myself, reinventing myself, putting the pieces back together would not have been possible without the people that helped me. Uh, I have a couple, of a couple of American sponsors, they're like my mom's, I have three of them. Uh, they provided family, while well, my friends on campus provided friends and also family. Uh, the fact that so many people come to learn about what it's like to be a refugee, or what it's like to have a friend who is who used to be a refugee or who is a refugee, is sometimes it's, it's a tough challenge because so many people cannot understand unless they experience it themselves. And uh, my advice on that part is like just take it easy and let it happen, and then you'll figure it out. Uh, but yeah, coming here was really really hard and. Education is a very important part, and I think that should be resolved. I think a lot of Syrians should, ha should have access to education. Back in Istanbul, we had our IDs, and our IDs were technically a paper that was printed out, and it, it was given to you, and they literally tell you to go to any like any bookstore and just like put it in the card, and that's going to be your ID. It's a printed card. It does not mean anything. Once it's written, it's gone. You don't exist. You have to go get another card. Uh, that card was supposed to give you access to education, health, and other uh, other uh, primary needs. But in so many cases, that failed. The system failed in providing those things to Syrians, specifically because of the language barriers. When when Syrian kids went to school, they did not speak Turkish. They were not taught Turkish well because the people who were teaching them did not know how to speak Arabic or English. And that caused a bigger problem because a lot of Syrian students are going to schools in Turkey learning Turkish language and forgetting the Arabic language and forgetting their own identity and becoming part of something new. Uh, the second part is the health part. It's also the same problem. A lot of Syrians cannot access health because of the, because of the issues that are on with the fact that a lot of Syrians go to, go to hospitals and aren't able to explain the kind of issues they have. And that uh, makes it really impossible for, for the doctor or any kind of nurse to work with them because they aren't able to know what's going on with them. Um, education in Turkey for children is a very is a, is a is a flawed system. It needs to be repaired. It needs to be fixed because so many so many kids are going to schools, and the fact that they're not able to learn the language or, sh or learn Turkish is making these kids, at from ages five to twelve plus, go to tailoring factories, work for sixteen hours. And some of them end up suffering from pneumonia, some of them end up suffering from very serious diseases that they cannot go to hospitals for because they don't have anyone to control them. Uh, being one of a thousand Syrian is something my roommate told me last year when I was going through a depressive episode. And he was like, no, I was here with one of a thousand Syrians that ended up in the US, going to college, studying psychology, have a scholarship, building yourself, friends things that we really don't dream of in the, in the other part of the world on the East. We do not, as I said before, dreaming of a way out it has become a logical part of what we do. You do not dream of something that you do not have access to. It's like you can't dream of flying if you don't have wings. And the fact that so many governments around the world are making it really, really hard for a lot of Syrians to get visas to go study anywhere is not helping the problem. See a lot of like a lot of these like events like that, like how we can change things around, and how we can fix this, and how we can help refugees, and how we can do that and this. But the problem is starts with the fact that the governments themselves are not allowing these organizations to do their jobs at a very good at a very good level because the governments themselves do not have the capacity or do not want the responsibility of taking refugees in. and. Maybe in 10 years I'll be the same, maybe in 10 years I'll be better. Any questions?
Um, your mom told you go to college and be a human being. And I thought of my students in my college, I, in my university, I tell them uh, be a human being as a journalist and see a human being on the other side of the camera. Uh, so I really like the quote of your mom. And I, and I often call my students my kids. Let me connect to my computer because another uh, testimony will be a one of a JRS graduate uh, from Kenya. Meeting innocent uh, virtually uh, was a, a real joy and it is my real joy to uh, introduce him to you now uh, at this panel. Innocent Silombo, whom I'm sure some in this room know, um, JRS graduate, uh, sharing his story. My name is Ntumba Silombo Innocent. I'm from Democratic Republic of Congo. I was born and grew up in Goma in the northern province of Kivu. And uh, since 2009, I fled my country up to Kenya and currently living in Kakuma refugee camp. I fled, I I fled my country after violence, uh, just uh, for, I mean, uh, targeted my family, uh, following my work of my father who was a journalist. Uh, after I was kidnapped, then uh, they came even after the entire family and they killed everybody and I was the only survivor. I could just uh, wait there until uh, they could also come after me. I just decided to leave the country and I was facilitated by my bishop who helped me to cross the border to Uganda and up to Kenya. And uh, it was such a very challenging uh, time uh, when I was also pursuing my higher education at the uh, Goma Polytechnic, uh, Polytechnic College uh, in electrical engineering, but all my dreams just uh, went that way and I uh, could not again continue with my education until I came here to the camp. And here in the camp, uh, I'm here since 2009. And uh, since I'm here, I've been, uh, I mean, I've been going through so many, several uh, things, bad and good. I've seen things happening, things going, things coming. And uh, I got, I've got the opportunity to just uh, go through a higher education opportunity through the Jesuit uh, worldwide learning. Uh, which is back in 2012 and uh, graduated in 2015 from Regis University and uh, I was connected virtually to Regis University uh, facilitated by Arup Learning Center. It's a learning center which is set up here in Kakuma to facilitate learners because as refugees we face too many challenges in regard of uh, access to uh, tools like computers or connectivity, but then, but now the learning center, Arupe, facilitates us to get access to all those uh, computer and connectivity and connect to our professors and to our university virtually and pursue our education. And my graduation was really uh, very, I was very happy to graduate after all my dreams just uh, disappeared. Again, I regained hope through my education and it was not only my joy myself, but also of the community because it helped shift the thinking in, uh, in the refugee camp from people from thinking like a refugee, like a, a temporary place whereby people should not build anything, should not just focus on anything. They should just wait for that right day, right, day, right time to leave the camp. But then it gave them motivation and showed them that they can also persevere and just concentrate on one thing, have visions like anyone else, even education vision, and through the education vision, they can also transform their societies and help themselves at the end. We are living in the camp, but the camp is not where our life will end. After There will come a time where we talk about after the camp. After the camp, I should be able to not just start from zero, but pick from somewhere. And for me to be able to pick from somewhere, it's because I did not waste my time while in the camp. When you get connected, you get the knowledge, you understand, you develop yourself, you gain some skills, which will help you even after the camp to be uh, someone valuable. And that also will save you from the normal life here in the camp, whereby people spend most of the time doing nothing, just inactivity. And uh, imagine inactivity and trauma, the, all the traumas that people went through, all those, they just affect people. And maybe you find people after a just short period, a few time, a short time, they are just like uh, wasted. They're no longer the person that you 
you knew before, it's because they are not building themselves, they're not, uh, I mean, developing themselves. And uh, it's only through education that someone can build themselves and become successful. And uh, when you look at the design of the learning center, it also helps again the student to come together, share knowledge, <coughs> collaborate, even feel like you belong to a community, yes, the community of learners, and later on they become your partner. For example, here in Kakuma, um, after graduating from Kakuma Ventures, going through several uh, higher education programs like the Geneva Summer School in higher education emergency, doing some intensive training on ICT, I we just realized that there, there's a gap here in the camp. And that gap was in terms of the workforce. Since people don't have access to the market of labor, don't have uh, access to any other opportunity, they should think critically and maybe be, become the solver of their own problems. And maybe we can start from that as now, currently the humanitarian assistance is getting down. They are cutting on the humanitarian assistance. People need to look at the other ways they could just help them survive and sustain themselves. And uh, those things have been, have been have received the even the support of the uh, humanitarian agencies, the UN agencies, even the uh, international community to support the refugees, even to just become entrepreneurs so that they can all sustain themselves. But again, because we went through higher education, that's why we came up to identify that there was a gap again in addressing this problem or in finding solutions to help the refugees becoming uh, self-sustainable. And again, we come together and we created Kakuma Ventures, NGOs that were supporting uh, like uh, uh, refugees to just build something for their livelihood while targeting running businesses. And how do you expect those refugees to have running businesses? They need to have somewhere they should start from. And to start from, they need to have like uh, access to a loan, which is impossible. I mean, access to capital, which is impossible. And all those became challenging. Then we created Kakuma Ventures, uh, like a community microfinance, whereby people uh, from the community can pull fund among themselves and put into one business and help someone get started. And that person will pay back the uh, Kakuma Ventures and reinvest to the next person. At least with that, we have been able even to help start a few people since we started just last year. But again, it has helped even uh, more people becoming at that stage where they could be able to receive this assistance from the NGOs that are supporting uh, running businesses. And it's in this um, effort that we have been addressing, whereby we came across with uh, the GRS, because we'll find most of our members in Kakuma Ventures, they, yeah, they were educated right from GRS, because the GRS is providing, like myself, uh, I did a, a diploma, I got a diploma in liberal studies, majoring in businesses. And the others even who are doing short course, certification course for six months in business and entrepreneurship in the camp. Then again, it was crucial for GRS to partner with us, uh, the student who graduated from GRS and come together and see how best again we can I mean, address the problems or bring solutions to the problem that affect us the most here in the camp. People in the conference, I'm very happy uh, that uh, I've been in this conference. And uh, after coming last, just last month, last month in September, I've been speaking at the e-learning uh, Africa conference. Again, I tried to share about access to education on this uh, humanitarian context. And again, I'm here again to advocate and just again to show the people that uh, there is a possibility that people from the camp can get access to education without them moving or the invest moving to them because we need to use the medium of technology that we currently have. And uh, for this one, I would like to invite even more universities to join this uh, movement to join the movement that the GWL, Inzone, and others have been into here in Kakuma and support the refugees to get higher education. Because with the refugee without higher education, they are not getting anything here in the camp. And this is a danger. And this time, is this the time, the right time for us to prevent this danger in the future? Because these people will become a burden to our society, and yet there are people who have skills, who have knowledge, and who can do something for themselves, even to help others. So let's build together this and let's come together. The refugees, there are some, we, they, we have a bunch of refugees who have graduated from various programs in the camp. 
they can be consultative, they can be helpful even to just remove that fear of the people who never been in a refugee camp, who never implemented the, any project in a refugee camp, and they can help them to get started, to show them the tips, what is the community perspective, and so on, and the program could be worked on. Because when we look at the um, ratio or the number of the people that are uh, participating into the, who are currently enrolled in higher education, it is very, very, very small. We need even more, more, more education providers to help these people to even absorb even more from 30 maybe to 50 to 100,000 and people get those, all those skills. And at the end, all of us will be better off. Let's clap our hands uh, to Innocent uh, and so many uh, refugees that are in Kakuma um, refugee camp. One quote from Innocent, we are living in a camp, but this is not where my life will end. Let this be an encouragement uh, for us here at this conference.